Hi, I'm Jade and I'm a medical student in Leicester. In this video, we will cover some ophthalmological conditions commonly seen and managed in primary care. We will revise dry eye syndrome, corneal abrasions or foreign bodies, and cataracts. This is the second installment of two videos on primary care ophthalmology. So if you haven't seen part one, I think you should check it out. Dry eye syndrome, or keratoconjunctivitis sicca, is a condition where either the eyes don't make enough tears or the tears evaporate too quickly. In the history, you'd want to ask about red flag symptoms, including acute onset, persistent or severe visual loss, or diplopia. Also ask about the current presenting symptoms. We need to establish whether or not this is the first episode of symptoms, when they started, and the duration of the symptoms. In the ocular history, you should ask about any previous ocular surgeries or diagnoses, contact lens use, current or past ocular medications, including over-the-counter medications, and homeopathic or herbal preparations. When you ask about the past medical history, in particular, look out for conditions that increase the risk of dry eye, like Sjogren's syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, neurological conditions like Parkinson's disease or Bell's palsy. In the drug history, look out for use of medications like anticholinergics, beta blockers, diuretics, antidepressants, or isotretinoin, which can all cause dry eye. The first step of any clinical examination is general inspection. Look at the patient as a whole. You may see signs that the patient has a systemic disease, like rheumatoid arthritis or Sjogren's, as we mentioned before, which will help you identify the cause of the dry eye syndrome. Inspect the eyelids for proptosis ectropion or entropion, which can cause dry eyes. Also, evert and look at the inner eyelids to look for flakes and crusting seen in blepharitis or papillae seen in conjunctivitis. Eye examination is usually normal in dry eye syndrome. However, it's important to examine the eye using fluorescent drops and a blue light to look out for corneal staining to rule out corneal ulcer, which can coincide with dry eyes when the cause is incomplete closing of the eyelids, such as in Bell's palsy. To formally diagnose dry eye syndrome, you will need to refer the patient to secondary care to have a slit lamp examination of the cornea and tear film, as well as a Shermer's test, which measures the amount of tears produced. If the patient has no red flags for serious eye pathologies and no signs of systemic conditions causing the dry eyes, then the patient does not need to be referred to secondary care and can be managed in the community. The most important step of management is education because dry eye syndrome is a chronic condition and there's no cure. Lifestyle measures can help symptoms. For example, warm compresses, lid hygiene, lid massage, avoiding the use of contact lenses when symptomatic, avoiding prolonged screen time or dry environments, and also lowering computer screens to below the eye level to decrease the lid aperture and hence reduce evaporation of tears from the eyes. If possible, it may be beneficial to review the patient's medications and consider alternatives to medications that can worsen dry eye syndrome. Some patients can benefit from the use of lubricant eye drops during the day and lubricant ointment at night for persistent symptoms. The difference between eye drops and eye ointment is that ointment is more viscous and can cause blurring of vision. However, its effects are more long-lasting as they take longer to evaporate from the eye's surface. If symptoms persist after 12 to 16 weeks, then it's appropriate to refer to secondary care for further management and consideration of alternative diagnoses. This slide summarizes some differential diagnoses of red eye. Next, let's talk about corneal abrasions and corneal foreign bodies. A corneal abrasion refers to trauma to the surface of the eye, for example, due to fingernail scratching, contact lens insertion or removal, or a foreign body. Patients will present with sudden onset of pain, lacrimation, conjunctival erythema and mild photophobia. They may complain of grittiness in the affected eye as well as blurry or decreased vision. In the history there will often be a cause for the corneal abrasion evident, such as difficult insertion or removal of a contact lens, an object striking the eye or even an object entering the eye. Ask about red flag symptoms such as significant visual disturbance, severe eye pain and severe headache or photophobia. 
On examination, you should use a white light to look for a foreign body on the ocular surface and in the inner eyelids of the affected eye. Also look for clouding, opacities or infiltrates in the cornea which may indicate chemical injury, corneal ulcer or infection. Other signs of corneal foreign body include linear vertical scratches on the cornea due to subtarsal foreign bodies moving with blinking and rust rings if the foreign body is metallic. Look for signs of perforation and penetration of the globe which would require urgent ophthalmological assessment. For example, dark material on the eye due to iris or choroid plugging the wound, pupil irregularities, or acute reduction in visual acuity. Then use fluorescent and blue light to look for corneal epithelial defects, which would show up as staining to the abraded area, usually linear or geographical shapes. Also look at the eye movements, as ophthalmoplegia is another red flag sign. Some patients will need immediate referral to secondary care. For example, in suspected penetrating eye injury or intraocular foreign body, or a corneal foreign body that cannot be removed in primary care. If the mechanism of injury was high velocity and there's a high risk of penetrating eye injury. If there is significant orbital or periorbital trauma. In chemical injury, although you must irrigate the eye immediately while awaiting transfer using saline for at least 20 minutes. Foreign bodies composed of organic material, or if the patient is unable to tolerate examination or foreign body removal in primary care. And lastly, if any of these red flag clinical features are present. If referral to ophthalmology is not indicated and there is a superficial foreign body present, then you can remove the foreign body using saline irrigation once you've been trained to do so. Measure visual acuity before and after foreign body removal. If saline irrigation fails, apply a topical ocular anesthetic and remove the foreign body using a sterile cotton bud. Metallic foreign bodies may leave a rust ring, which requires follow-up and removal by ophthalmology within one to two days. For both corneal abrasions and foreign bodies, patients can be advised to use oral analgesia, like ibuprofen, for discomfort. Ocular lubricant drops or ointment can be used for symptomatic relief if required. A stat dose of chloramphenicol ointment 1% should be given, then the patient should continue to use the ointment for five days. They should also wear a double eye pad with three strips of tape for 12 to 24 hours. Make a next day follow-up appointment, although the patient should be advised to seek urgent medical review if the symptoms get worse. Consider referral of the patient to ophthalmology if vision worsens, symptoms are not improving, or there are signs that a corneal infiltrate, ulcer or infection has developed. Advise the person on suitable eye protection to prevent injury in the future, for example safety goggles. The eye should not be touched or rubbed and contact lenses should be avoided as well while the eye recovers. The final topic for this video is cataracts. Cataracts are mostly managed in primary care until the symptoms are severe enough to warrant surgery. A cataract refers to an opacity of the lens causing gradual and painless reduction of visual acuity as light cannot effectively reach the retina. Cataracts are the leading cause of curable blindness worldwide. They are most likely caused by increasing age, but they can also be congenital. The most common cause for congenital cataracts is infection with rubella. In the UK, all babies are screened for congenital cataracts at birth as part of the physical examination of newborn babies and again when they're between six to eight weeks of age. Risk factors for developing cataracts include increasing age, smoking, diabetes mellitus, systemic corticosteroids, or female gender. A patient may experience symptoms such as blurred vision, reduced night vision, halos around lights, and a gradual reduction of color intensity. On examination, there may be a white pupil, which is known as leukocoria, which is seen on general inspection but also when using the ophthalmoscope, sensitivity to light, reduction in visual acuity, and on ophthalmoscopy there'll be a defect in the red reflex. Investigations are usually performed by an optometrist, so in suspected cataracts, refer for full investigations, including a slit lamp examination to physically examine the lens, plus a glare vision test. 
This slide summarizes some differential diagnoses for gradual visual disturbance, taken from NICE CKS. In the early stages, cataracts can be managed in primary care. Conservative measures include increasing the strength of glasses and encouraging use of brighter lighting. Provide patients who wish to drive with advice on fitness to drive. Visual acuity must be at least Snellen 6 over 12 with both eyes, else the patient must notify the DVLA. HGV drivers must have a higher standard of visual acuity. Surgery will eventually be needed. This involves removing the cloudy lens and replacing this with an artificial one. Base the decision to refer a patient for cataract surgery on a discussion with them to determine the impact on quality of life and also patient choice. Whether both eyes are affected, whether benefits outweigh the risks and also visual acuity should all be taken into account. You should discuss the risks and benefits of cataract surgery with patients that you are going to refer. Benefits include improved visual acuity, improved clarity of vision, plus improved color vision. Risks occur in about 2% of cases. For example, posterior capsular opacification, which is where the remaining epithelial cells of the lens proliferate and cause the lens to become opaque again. Posterior capsule rupture and or vitreous loss is the most common intraoperative complication. Corneal decompensation is where lens fragments are retained in the anterior chamber, leading to swelling of the cornea. Detachment of the retina can occur up to months after the operation. And endophthalmitis refers to inflammation of aqueous and or of the vitreous humor, which can lead to visual loss. Thanks for watching.